And then we'll pray. Romans 5, 6 says this, For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then. Having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for reconciling us through Christ. And as we read your scripture today, I pray that we would be amazed at Jesus' work and we would rejoice in the good news of the gospel. And Lord, we also pray for those who have not yet responded to that good news, that today would be the day that they do so. And as they go into this Christmas season, they truly would know Christ for the first time as Lord. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Why is the good news good? It's an important question. We often throw around terms like good, assuming the goodness of certain things without considering if or why they might be good. Say a certain movie's good, but why was it good? What, what was in it that made it good? The plot, the actress, the script, the morals, <laughs> the action might say pizza's good. What kind of goodness are we talking about? What somebody likes on their pizza is far different than what somebody else likes. Those things are, of course, both relative, right? What's good to one person is terrible to somebody else. One person thinks A Wonderful Life is the best Christmas movie ever. Somebody else is bored to tears the entire time. Is all goodness relative? Is there anything about goodness that is objectively good? Well, certainly. You think of a starving orphan who's adopted, well-fed, well-loved, that's objectively a good thing. That child goes from certain suffering to blessing, and that is undoubtedly good. A murderer is arrested, convicted, and sentenced. Again, something is objectively good because justice is done. What about the gospel of Jesus Christ? Well, regardless of what somebody believes about the Bible, this too is objectively good Amen. because it's the power of God to salvation. And even atheists can admit that the idea of a God who actively, willingly saves people from the wrath due to sin, that is a good thing, even if they don't personally believe it. It's objectively good. But what is it that makes it good? Of course, the word gospel itself literally means good news. So that's the assumption. But why is it good? And as we started last week, that's the subject of Paul as he gets into Romans chapter 5. Recall that after he'd given the bad news that all people, Jew and Gentile, have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God, Paul, at that point, ever since, has been writing of the good news, that we can be saved, and he says that the Bible tells us how we can receive salvation. How so? Well, through justification by faith, via a sovereign judicial act, as God declares us righteous for no other reason than our faith in the person and in the work of Jesus. And as we saw at the end of chapter 4, like Abraham of old, who believed the promises of God, and then God put his own righteousness into Abraham's account. So God does with us when we believe what God says in his word about Jesus, his son. So once Paul had established the doctrine of justification by faith, he began to describe it in detail. This is the heart of the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And what is it that makes this good news so good? Well, what we saw in the first five verses of chapter 5 last time is one, it's good because what we have because of the gospel, and two, it's good because of who we become because of the gospel. Amen. Well, we have the benefits. It's amazing. We've got justification from our past. We've got peace from God, or peace with God, and access to his grace in the present. We've got the joyful hope of glory in the future. Likewise, who we become through the gospel is also wonderful because we're molded and we're shaped into the image of Christ. And as tremendous as all of that is in those first five verses, Paul isn't done yet. What makes the good news of the gospel so good, good isn't only what we receive or who we become. It's also what we experience. And what we experience is nothing less than the unparalleled love of God 
and eternal peace, reconciliation with him. We see it in two ways. One, what Jesus did in his death, demonstrating the love of God. And two, what Jesus does in his resurrected life, forever reconciling us to God. What makes the good news good? Our salvation in Jesus Christ through his death and his resurrection. This is something we need to believe, but it's also something in which we can rejoice. So we see it starting in verses 6 through 8 with what Jesus did in his death. What did Jesus do in his death? Verse 6, for when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, notice the first word of the verse, for. That's not unusual. A lot of verses begin that way, but it is something to notice because it's a conjunction. Grammatically speaking, it's a conjunction. So it joins the thought starting in verse 6 with the thought that ended in verse 5. And the last thing Paul wrote of in verse 5 was the love of God poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And so we know at that point we are the recipients of the love of God. But at that point, Paul only gave the bare statement of the fact. So what this love looks like is what Paul goes on to describe in verses 6 through 8. And what it looks like is seen in various aspects of Jesus' death. First is the timing of Jesus' death. The timing of it. He came at just the right time. Our translation says, in due time. I like what the Holman Christian Standard translates this as. It says, at the appointed moment, which speaks specifically to the timing of Jesus' birth, life, and death. Now, as we enter the Christmas season, it's entirely appropriate to consider the time in which Jesus came. It wasn't random. It wasn't coincidental that God sent Jesus when he did. On the contrary, God sent Jesus at just the right time in just the right way to accomplish the right things for his eternal plan. Paul put it this way to the Galatians, Galatians 4, 4, and 5, but when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. In the fullness of time, now Paul uses different wording, but he says the same thing to the Romans as he did to the Galatians here. In the fully completed time, at just the right time, God sent Jesus to accomplish the work of salvation. Now let me ask you, when was the last time you considered the timing of Jesus's earthly ministry, and his death, and his resurrection. The timing, it was perfect. If Jesus had been sent too soon, well, he, of course, wouldn't have been able to fill many of the prophecies we see in Daniel. Otherwise, he might have lived during the wrong worldwide empire. You wouldn't have had the Pax Romana over the, the area. All sorts of things would have gone wrong. If he had come at a much later time, again, Prophecies in Daniel and other places would have fallen short. The temple of Jerusalem might have already been destroyed because that was destroyed in 70 AD, which eliminated the fulfillment of other prophecies, and the whole ability of the gospel to spread would have been hindered. Certainly, if God had waited until today, until 2019 to send Jesus, not only would there have been all those problems with prophecy, but consider all the billions of people who would have perished without even the possibility of hearing of Christ. No, God neither waited too long, nor did he send Jesus too soon. He sent Jesus at just the right time, in the fullness of time, it says here, in due time. The plan of God is perfect. And it's perfect regarding Jesus' birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection. And if that's the case, surely it's perfect regarding the minutia of our own lives as well. We need to trust his plan. We need to trust his timing because God does everything right on time. And about the time of Jesus' death, consider our own status. What does Paul write about us at that time? What were we at that time? Well, it says here that we were without strength. Now, the ESV says weak, and I like the ESV, but with all due respect to the English Standard Version, we were more than just weak. We were, as the New American says, helpless. Or as the NIV says, we were powerless. We were totally absent of ability fully without strength. Someone in the hospital might be weak, but still capable to do certain things. All I can eat is jello. Well, you're still eating something, even if it ain't much, it ain't good. But somebody who's dead can't do anything at all. What were we without Christ? We were dead in our trespasses and our sins, Ephesians chapter 2. We weren't able to do just a little regarding Jesus. We could do nothing. In our sins, we were 
without strength. We were powerless to save ourselves, utterly unable to present ourselves to God as anyone else than people deserving his wrath. Because at that time, we were impious, we were irreverent. As Paul says, we were ungodly, sinful people. I mean, put it together, that's not a good combination to describe us, is it? Prior to our faith in Christ, we were spiritually dead and utterly ungodly, yet that's what makes the timing of Jesus' death so amazing, because that was when he died for us. And that leads us to the second point about Jesus' death. Not only its timing, but its improbability. Look at verse 7. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. For whom might someone die? Well, rarely for a righteous man. In other words, we're talking about righteous as the world defines righteous, not as God defines righteous. According to the standard of God, there's no one righteous. No, not one. We read that Romans chapter 3, verse 10, quoting from the Psalms. But according to the standard of the world, it's possible for some people to appear to live righteously, perhaps morally, perhaps even religiously, Uh, They might be exacting to the standard of the world, upstanding citizens in the community. Maybe somebody's a leader in the business community. Maybe someone's a CEO of a charitable organization. In Paul's day, it may have been a Pharisee. In fact, he even claimed that about himself. According to the standard of the Jews, he was a righteous man at that time. You know, somebody that's a morally upright leader in the community. For such a person as this, it would be rare, but someone might die for that person like a soldier laying down his life for his brother in arms. Secret service, putting his or her life on the line for, you know, whoever the president is at the time. Someone might rarely die for the so-called worldly standard righteous person. Even more likely, but far more rare, someone might dare to die for a good person, as Paul says. And again, this would be the standard of the world rather than the standard of God, because there's no one good but God. Jesus made that statement, Mark chapter 10, verse 18. God alone is truly good. He's a standard of even our very concept of goodness. But that's not the idea Paul has in mind here. Again, it's how people commonly think. How the Romans would have thought at the time, most likely, like our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers would think even today, they could think of people they would consider good. And this is, of course, this world's uh, uh, idea. And it's different than the world's idea of righteousness. According to the world, and this is Paul's argument, a good man is better than a righteous man because he has goodness in addition to his righteousness. Do you follow? Right? A righteous man might be morally strict but dispassionate. A righteous man might do everything the right way but still maybe even be self-centered, just caring about himself nobody else. But a good man has kindness, love, compassion in addition to his morality. That's the, the statement Paul is making here. You know, a business leader might be seen by others as righteous for his unwillingness to cheat his customers and his employees, but not necessarily good with the idea of being generous towards others. The good person for the world has something more than morals. He has love or she has compassion. For such a person, other people might be glad to sacrifice themselves. As Paul said, they might even dare to die for someone like that. If someone risks their life for you, you might be willing to risk your life for them in return. Not a guarantee, but it's certainly a possibility. Somebody might dare to do it. But the point in either one of these examples is that each one of those things are very rare. They're rare. For people to be willing to die, it's improbable. It requires something extraordinary. Those aren't situations most people just jump at the chance to volunteer for. Now, with that in mind, consider what God did through Jesus. Because as rare as the examples among men might be, God takes a monumental leap forward as we see the third point of Jesus' death, which is the love of God. Verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When did Jesus die for us? Not when we were righteous, nor when we were good, because guess what? We were never either one of those things. He died for us when we were still sinners. With humans, there's only the slightest possibility of us sacrificing ourselves for others. You know, that's in the rarest of circumstances. And really, if we would do it, it would only be for the best of people. I'm not going to waste my life on somebody who doesn't deserve it. With God, Jesus willingly sacrificed himself at the right time for the worst of people. Newsflash, we're all the worst of people. None of us is truly righteous. 
none of us can claim to be good. And it was for people like us that Jesus died without hesitation. By the way, some people say, well, what do you mean Jesus didn't hesitate? Of course he hesitated. What happened in the Garden of Gethsemane? He prayed to the Father that there might be another way. Well, that wasn't hesitation on Jesus' part regarding us. That's a realistic viewpoint of the physical and the spiritual suffering he was about to endure when God placed his entire wrath for all of sin for all time right upon his shoulders. And even then, Jesus didn't hesitate because what did he follow up his prayer with immediately in the very next verse? Not my will, but yours be done. So he didn't hesitate at all. Jesus willingly died, and he willingly died for sinners. Who does such a thing? Not us. We don't have that within us. Few of us would be willing to die for a neighbor we barely know, but, you know, they've always been nice to us in the driveway. Surely a relatively nice person. We'd be rarely willing to do that, much less the people who have hurt and offended us. How many of us would be willing to die for criminals? How many of us want to lay down our life for the murderer on death row? Or for the rapist? Or for anybody else who's there that with the worst of the crimes we can think? We don't want it. We want them to die. Jesus died for sinners. When Jesus died, he died for all. Everyone in the entire world who has so heinously sinned against God. Where do we find our answer for sin? At the cross of Christ. It was for sinners that Christ died. It was for people like us. And what does this do? Paul says it demonstrates the love of God. This is the demonstration, it says, of his own love toward us. You know, back in the 90s, there was a pop song that said love needed to be more than words. And it's saying of the worldly carnal love. God's love for us is surely more than words but it's pure, it's holy, it's love that is beyond the reaches of our imaginations. How grand is the love of God towards us? It's something that can only be expressed by the willing sacrifice of his only begotten son. And this is where we get one of the most famous verses in the entire Bible, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What kind of love is this? That's virtually incomprehensible. Who are we that Jesus should be sent to die? Again, we are not deserving of his death, being neither righteous nor good. We are sinners. We are those who hated God. We are those who acted against God. Yet still God loved us and sent Jesus to die for us. This is the grand demonstration of his love. It's better than any card of Valentine's Day. It's better than any love letter. Better than anything we can imagine is the cross of Christ. Right there is the demonstration of God's love for you. By the way, how can we know this is still the demonstration of God's love for us today? Well, look at the word that's used in the Bible. God demonstrates. It's not so obvious in the English, but it's very obvious in the Greek. This is in the present tense. Present tense. So not only did God demonstrate in the past his love, he continually demonstrates his love towards us every day through the cross of Christ. How so? Well, consider when Jesus died, nearly 2,000 years ago in the past, in history. Yet did his death of the cross only demonstrate the love of God towards Peter and John and Andrew and Mary and those who were there at the time? No. The cross of Christ is the demonstration of God's love towards all of us today, even two millennia later. And the cross of Jesus will be the demonstration of God's love toward us for all time into the future. Think of how the apostle John saw Jesus in his revelation, not chapter one, we're talking further on revelation chapter five. He saw Jesus as a lamb who had been slain. Jesus' sacrifice at the cross is central to his identity, not just for now, but for all time. We will always know God's love towards us by remembering Jesus' sacrifice for us. Now, I want us to stop here for just a minute because we don't want to gloss over this incredible truth that God loves us. Because how is this possible? We're so vile, we're so sinful, we're so disturbed. Yet God loves us. God loves us corporately as the human race because he sent Jesus to die for all the world, all men and all women everywhere. Jesus loves us individually God knows us individually as his own creation. He knit us together in our mother's wombs. He knows the number of hairs on our head. He knows us by name. God 
loves us. Now, often we have a hard enough time loving ourselves. We know who we are. I know who I am. Despite the face everybody else sees, you know who you are, despite the face everybody else sees. We know our struggles. We know our darkest secrets. And should we find just one person on earth who loves us for who we are, we consider that a miracle. That's the person we want to be married to for the rest of our life. And that's just from another human being, another sinful human being. Yet for the perfect, almighty, infinite God, that God loves us us, knowing us. There's no reason on earth. There's no reason in heaven why God should want to love us. There's nothing that compels him to love us. He's in need of nothing, and we can offer him nothing apart from the grace that he already gives us. Think of it. You know, when you send your, your, your six-year-old off to get you a Christmas present, what do you do? You give them the money. They go buy you a Christmas present. You're giving a present to yourself is what you're doing, right? The only thing they can offer you is what you already gave them. That's all we offer to God is what he already gave us or his grace. He doesn't have to love us. He chooses to love us. Amen. He chose to send Jesus to the cross for us. He chose to offer us a gift of salvation. What kind of love is this? How grand is the love of God? Have you ever questioned it? Have you ever doubted it? God's love for you? You look to the cross. and When you look there, you should never doubt again. Again, it's the demonstration of his love for you, the proof beyond proof that God loves you to an unfathomable extent. He sent Jesus to die for you. And if that doesn't convince you of the love of God, nothing I can say will ever do it. So you put it together so far. What did Jesus do in his death? Well, aside from the miracle of justification, which Paul has written about in length in previous chapters, Jesus did something amazing. When Jesus died, he demonstrated the love of God towards sinners. He died for us at the perfect time. He died for the most improbable of people. He did, uh, you know, it's this improbability that demonstrates his love for us. So Jesus died for you. He died for me. This is the proof of the grandeur of his love. And this is one of the reasons we can know that the good news of the gospel is so good. But it's not only Jesus' death which makes the gospel good. We also see it through Jesus' life. And this is what we see in verses 9 through 11, what Jesus does through his resurrection. Verse 9, what more then, or I should say much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Now in verse 9, of course, Paul hasn't yet directly written of Jesus' resurrection, but he starts to introduce the idea of it. And he does so with this. He says that Jesus saves us from wrath. What is the wrath of God? Well, obviously, it's what we deserve. The wrath of God is God's righteous anger. It's his justice. It's his good response towards sin. It's what ungodly sinners deserve. And remember in verses 6 through 8, we learn that we are ungodly sinners, yet it's not what we receive. Instead of wrath, we receive deliverance. It says here, we have been saved. Saved. And again, we don't want to gloss over the language just because we use it so much. We use the term saved all the time in the church. But let's think about it for a minute. Who is it that needs to be saved? People who are in danger. Someone in danger of drowning needs to be saved by a lifeguard. Someone in danger of dying from a heart attack needs to be saved by a doctor. A soldier under fire needs to be saved by his or her troop. To be saved, guess what? That's not something somebody chooses to do in their best of days. That's something for which we cry out, during our worst of days. No one chooses to be saved. Well, I think I'm going to be saved today, and I think I'm also going to wear the, the red T-shirt today. You know, the thought of salvation doesn't even register in our mind in that time. It's only when somebody recognizes that he or she is in danger that all of a sudden they're looking around, who is it that can save me right now? Men and women, we are in danger. That was Paul's point during those first several chapters of the book of Romans, that all people have sinned, all people have fallen short of the glory of God. We're in danger. We've rebelled against God in innumerable, in terrible ways, and we are in dire danger of God's wrath. And exactly, it's that from which we need to be saved. And that's what Jesus so graciously offers through his cross and his resurrection. And how does that salvation come, right? How does salvation from wrath come? It comes only after it says, we have been justified by his blood. Now, just as a review, let's recall this idea of justification. We've been made right. We've been declared right in the sight of God. We have no true righteousness of our own. We're infinitely devoid of righteousness. 
God imputes to us the righteousness of Christ. He puts it into our account. He justifies us like a, a scale being adjusted to zero prior to weighing something. So we're adjusted by God with the righteousness of Jesus. And what's the method by which God did it? It's Jesus' sacrifice at the cross. It's his blood that he shed for us. Now, obviously, at this point, contextually, blood is a synonym for death. And Paul is really just writing of Jesus' role as a sacrificial lamb on our account. But at the same time, please don't miss the fact that the perfect, eternal, incarnate Son of God literally shed blood for us. God the Son put on human flesh. And that's what we celebrate at Christmas, not Santa, not presents, not any of that stuff, right? We're celebrating the incarnation of Jesus. He put on human flesh for the very purpose of having that flesh beaten, whipped, bruised, and pierced for us. God the Son placed himself in human form, becoming a true human, with human blood pumping through his human veins for the specific purpose of having that blood ripped out of his skin and poured out on the ground for our sake. That's a gift incomprehensible privilege, grace. That's what the Lord Jesus did for you and for me. And what can we do except in awe, believe and surrender ourselves to his glorious lordship. And it's because Jesus shed his blood for us that we are justified in God's sight and saved from God's wrath. And as good as that is, it's even better than what we might initially think. We're not only saved from God's wrath in eternity, we're saved from God's wrath in the present. When Paul writes that we are saved from God's wrath, it means we're saved from all of God's wrath. Now, although we still sin from time to time, and don't kid yourself, you still sin, I still sin, I know it. Right? We still sin from time to time. What happens during that time? We still, as believers in Christ, we still have access to Jesus' grace. Right? We still have access to the forgiveness of Jesus. So we never face the wrath of God again. We will never face God as do those who are not God's children. We will never face the fullness of his wrath because 100% of God's wrath has been poured out on Jesus for our sake. Which, by the way, is a great argument for the pre-tribulation rapture because the church is not subject to the wrath of God which is to be poured out on the earth. Obviously, it doesn't mean that God doesn't discipline us from time to time. Surely he does. But God's discipline is different than God's wrath. God's discipline is something that he gives as a father to his children. He loves his children too much to see us continue sinning. God's discipline, as hard as it is, that's proof of God's ongoing love for you who are in Christ Jesus. It isn't pleasant in the moment, but it is assuring when we receive it. You can read about that in Hebrews chapter 12. But it isn't God's wrath. We are forever saved from his wrath. So those who believe in Jesus having been justified by the shedding of Jesus' blood, have been saved from the wrath of God. Before we go any further, I need to know, or you need to ask yourself, rather, is this something you know for yourself? Mm -hmm. Have you been saved from the wrath of God? And are you absolutely sure? Because according to the word of God, you can be absolutely sure. What does the salvation from wrath look like? looks like reconciliation from war. Pick up in verse 10. For if, we, if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. The idea of reconciliation, that's a pretty important one here in Romans chapter 5. The word appears three times in three different forms in verses 10 and 11. Uh, the definition of this word is probably what we would expect to be. It's the exchange of hostility for a friendly relationship. Reconciliation, that makes sense. It's this idea of reconciliation with God, though. That is the crux that might cause a little discomfort for some people. Because after all, we can imagine situations in which we have hostility with one another as humans. People are engaged with lawsuits uh, opposed to one another. You know, they're opposed. Military rivals are opposed. They're engaged in hostility and warfare. That takes place on a human level. But we say, well, can that sort of thing still take place between men and God? Well, absolutely it can. The Bible shows many instances throughout the pages that it can and that it does take place. Left to ourselves, we are engaged in hostilities toward God. Like two opposing nations, we are enemies against God, albeit we're hopelessly outmatched by him. Now, some people raise the objection. They say, well, of course, that might be true of others. 
I can see how they've lived their life in just all kinds of sinful living, throwing their life away. But that's, that's not really true of me. I've never been hostile towards God. I haven't given much thought, but I've never been hostile toward them. I've never been his enemy. The Bible begs to differ. Paul says very specifically here that we were enemies against our creator God. The word used specifically speaks of those who are at hostility with someone else. People who are violently opposed to one another, having active hatred towards them. That's what's included in that word enemies. That was us. Now, we might not think of ourselves in that way, but without Jesus, that's exactly what we are. Without Jesus, we are God's enemies. That's why Jesus could say to the Jews in his day, you are children of the devil, not children of Abraham. And this, by the way, this isn't a subjective idea. Well, one person might be more of an... No, it's not that at all. It's not inflated hyperbole. Oh, you're just saying that to make a point. No, it's left to ourselves without Jesus. The fact that we are enemies of God, that's a statement of fact. Consider for a moment what sin actually is. Sin is rebellion. And when rebellion is committed against a sovereign ruler like a king, what's that called? Treason. If we were sailing a ship, it would be called mutiny, right? Rising up against the captain to rebel against our king, demanding our own will to be done in our lives rather than his will, declaring, I'm sovereign over my life, not you. That is an act of treason. When we sin, we're declaring to God that he has no sovereign right to rule in our lives. We're kicking him off the throne that belongs to him, putting ourselves in his place. See, this changes what sin is. Sin isn't, you know, a mere indiscretion against God. It's committed an act of treason against the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Every lie, every lustful thought, every time we engage in sinful fantasies, or when we hate our brother and sister while we're extolling ourselves, these acts of rebellion confirm we are enemies of God. But notice, please, the tense. That is what we were, not what we are. You were enemies of God. What changed? What changed is the fact that we've been reconciled. All hostilities have been made to cease. Where once there was opposition, now there's reconciliation. Where once there was war, now there's peace. What happened? How did it come? Well, it came through the death of the Son of God. It came through the cross. Question, who takes the initiative in this reconciliation? God. Isn't that amazing by itself? Because you think about it, we should be the ones responsible for a reconciliation. We were the rebels after all. Uh, you know, somebody wants to experience the mercy of the federal government. They, they don't ask the feds to do anything and make, you know, feds, you got to make it right and then we'll be reconciled together. No, they go to the judge. They throw themselves on the mercy of the court. Now, they offer to pay restitution, do whatever, right? But that's not how it works with God. When it comes to us being reconciled with God, well, we can't, first of all, we can't do anything. We can't really offer anything to him. Anything we would offer would never be good enough. Only Jesus can do something and he does. He's the one who takes the initiative. Despite the fact that he was the one who was offended, he's the one who reaches out to us with the offer of reconciliation. So yeah, we still throw ourselves upon the mercies of the court of God, but God in his grace has already made the provision of his mercy. That's in the gift of his son. Do we understand what grace it is to be reconciled to God through Jesus? Because in an instant, we go from facing eternal wrath to having all of God's wrath removed. And in an instant, we've gone from being God's enemies to becoming God's friends. And more than that, becoming his family, becoming his children. That's reconciliation. We sang about it today. That is amazing grace. Beloved in Christ, you are no longer at war against God. In Christ, you have been reconciled and saved. Hopefully that's something you know. Hopefully that's something of which you're assured. And if you are, as a Christian, is this something that you remember? Is this something in which you live? So often we walk around as if we think God is still mad at us. As if God is still at war against us. Not so. Not if you're in Christ. If you're in Christ, you've been reconciled to God. We need to remember that he set us at peace with God and that all hostilities between us have ceased. Now, again, it doesn't mean that we never sin against God. We don't do things that... We regret we don't rebel against him. But if we're in Christ, we will never be in permanent rebellion against God. That's glorious. That's a gift of grace. 
So we need to stop beating ourselves up and rejoice in the reconciliation that he has given us. But there's more to our salvation and the reconciliation than what happened at the cross. There's also what's guaranteed through Jesus' resurrected life. Now, we're already reconciled to God when we believe upon Jesus. We believe on his death of the cross. We experience part of our salvation, but there's more to our salvation than that. Now we also look forward to the future. What does Paul say in the future tense? We shall be, we shall be saved by his life. Our guarantee of the future is based on the present life of Jesus, right? This goes back to the resurrection. Jesus was dead, now he is alive. He is presently living, proven the Sunday following the cross, right? Jesus' tomb was empty. So his life, his resurrected life, is our guarantee of future eternal salvation. Because Jesus lives forever, we are guaranteed forever reconciliation. We are assured forever salvation. The bottom line here is that Jesus saves us not only by his death, but by his life. He saves us by his resurrected life. This is one reason that when we preach the gospel, we preach more than the cross. Now, that sounds offensive to a lot of people straight off the bat, but think about it. Without the cross, of course, we haven't preached Jesus. But the cross by itself, the cross alone is not the good news. If all we knew of Jesus is that he died on the cross with nothing else following... That's not good news. All that tells us is that somebody else died like everybody else died. We don't have any proof that Jesus' death was anything different or special. So more than that, more than the cross, we need the resurrection. Amen. Right? Without the resurrection, we have no reason to think that Jesus was anything special. Right. He himself prophesied, by the way, that he would go to the cross and rise from the grave. Matthew 12, 40, Matthew 16, 21, Matthew 17, 23, Matthew 20, verse 19. That wasn't a one-off interpretation of maybe Jesus meant that. No, he said it repeatedly. So if Jesus died on the cross, but he didn't rise from the grave, he'd be a false prophet in which we would have no hope whatsoever. But Jesus did rise from the dead, and his resurrection is crucial to the proclamation of the gospel. Again, it's the proof that he's the son of God. It's the proof of our hope in him. Now, that being the case, we have a wonderful reason to rejoice. Let's look at verse 11 here. Not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Reconciled people rejoice in God through the resurrected Savior. Without a crucified and resurrected Jesus, we have no reconciliation with God. We have no peace with him. But through Jesus' sacrifice of the cross, risen from the grave, we have peace. We have been delivered from the wrath of God. We've been put at peace with Almighty God. As a Christian, do you think you have reason to rejoice? Absolutely. We of all people can rejoice all day, every day, because of our reconciliation with God. You say, well, that's nice preacher talk. But stop exaggerating. We all have bad days in which we don't rejoice. Sure, we have bad days. And never once did the Apostle Paul deny it. He talked openly about his suffering at other times. He doesn't even imply that we should paste on smiling faces and pretend that we're happy when we're not. That's not the point. The idea here is that although occasional circumstances come up from time to time, this is the generality of our lives. When we step back to look at the larger picture, in other words, when we step back to look at our eternity with God, Christians who are reconciled with God, we can rejoice. Sure, we have days of suffering, weeks, months, years of suffering, for 60, 70, 80 years on earth. Guess what? We're destined for, we sang about 10,000. We could easily sing about 1 million, 10 million, 100 billion years with God in heaven. And through all that time, we will never be at war against God because we've been permanently put at peace with him. Our reconciliation with God is something that will never, ever change. That's a reason to rejoice. As we close it out, Don't miss the mode of rejoicing through our Lord, Jesus Christ. The historical fact of Jesus' death and resurrection is wonderful, but by itself, that doesn't save anybody. We need faith in Jesus to be our Lord, the Christ, the Messiah of God, to be saved. Someone can know the basic facts of Jesus' earthly ministry, recite the basics of Easter, Passover week, and not be saved. What is needed is an application from knowledge to faith. Knowledge is good, knowledge is necessary, but knowledge by itself is not enough. 
A person needs to move from the point of mentally knowing the Bible calls Jesus Lord to the point of saying, Jesus is my Lord. I've surrendered my life to him. So what did Jesus do in his resurrection? He saved us. He reconciled us to God, to the glory of God, and to the joy of the reconciled. So we ask the question, why is the good news good? What makes it good? It's good because it's a demonstration of God's love for us. It's good because it's the news of God's peace made with us. It's good because of what Jesus did at the cross and in his resurrection, forever ensuring our place with God and his family in heaven. God loves you. God wants to be reconciled to you. That is good news. That's not subjectively good. It's not relatively good. It isn't dependent on the preferences of the individual person. That's objectively good. Good for all people in all places at all times. The gospel is good news. But again, that goodness is only experienced when it's applied. That good news, it's available to the entire world, but it's known only by some. We must believe. How are we justified? By faith. If we do not believe that Jesus is our Lord and Savior sent by God as his Christ into the world, then we do not apply the good news of the gospel. And when we don't believe the message, then we don't experience the love that God's already demonstrated at the cross. We don't experience the reconciliation he gives through Jesus' resurrection. So it comes down to this basic question, do you believe? Now, perhaps you're here and you're in a place that all of us have been at one point, the ungodly sinner, the treasonous rebel, Maybe you haven't thought of your sin against God was all that bad, but, well, the Word of God testifies something different. And I have a very good feeling that the Holy Spirit of God is testifying in your heart something different. As a sinner, you are at war against God, being His enemy, awaiting His wrath. I implore you, flee the wrath of God. Flee the danger you're in and be saved. God loves you and He graciously offers to save you, so be saved, be reconciled to God. Be made at peace with him through Jesus Christ. And the very moment you put your faith in Jesus by repenting of your sins and trusting Jesus with your whole heart, you'll be transformed from God's enemy to God's child and you'll be forever reconciled with him. Maybe you're here as a believing Christian and I hope that most of us here today are that. Let us rejoice in our reconciliation. Be so overwhelmed by the demonstrated love of God for you in Christ Jesus. Be amazed every day by the fact you've been put at eternal peace with God. Let it shape and change your perspective during your trials. Let it shape your choices with people. How can we continue with grudges against one another when we've been made at peace with God? How can we hate our brother who's just like us when God loved us at the point we were nothing like him? The good news of the gospel seen in God's love and peace through Jesus isn't something that just transforms our relationship with him. It ought to be something that transforms our entire lives, period. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this good news. Thank you for what Jesus did at the cross and in his resurrection. Thank you that you loved us enough to send Jesus for us. Thank you, Lord, that when you sent Jesus for us, He was victorious, and he did the work you sent him to do, and now we have been reconciled with you, made at peace. And Lord, I do pray that that would transform our lives, not just make us uh, devotional in our times with you, though that's wonderful, we need that, but let that change how we live our lives with one another as well. Father, I also pray for those who have not yet responded to this good news. Help them now. Move to the application of the facts. Help them have faith. Give them what they need in this moment to respond to Christ Jesus, calling out for him to be their Lord, their Savior, forgiving them of their sins, surrendering their lives to him as Lord. We love you. And I thank you, Lord, that you do save every single person. (laughs) who calls upon you by faith. We love you, Lord, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.